Welcome to the Busy Guy Show. My name is Vince Lacasio, and I'm a busy guy. I've got a really busy guy here, Ronnie Rice, formerly of the New Colony Six. Hi, Vince. Hey, how you doing? I'm great. Thanks for inviting me on the program. It's a pleasure to have you here. My pleasure. Great to see you. Um, and before we move on, I was going to say, now you're performing over 100 concerts a year. Yeah, that used to be the case. Is that right? Why? How many is down to now? 67? That's about 101. 101. No, it's actually less. So, you know, times have changed. We're getting older. People you are, are dropping. We are. What? We are. Anyways. Just kidding. Go ahead. It's my turn. No, no I'll sure be honest that. with you. I'll be, let me just very. I know you want to ask me we questions. We got good chemistry. Go ahead. But I have to tell you, it's, a, it's not 100 anymore. It's a little less than that now. Yeah. I'm an older person. But it's pretty good. I'm so this all started. You started playing the guitar at 16, and you haven't put it down since. Actually, I, I took lesson, guitar lesson when I was 13. But I had a record out when I was 16 years old. Uh, 13, I took a year worth of guitar lessons. <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> and uh, since then, yeah, I've, been, I've always wanted to hit record. That was on my mind. I was lucky enough to meet a Dick Biondi. I found out where he lived in Evanston. Mm -hmm. I knocked on his door because I'm from Evanston. And I was thrilled. He was the thing in 1961 at WLS. So this was pre-Beatles. This was oh, yeah. Elvis. Yeah, kind of this deal. is when they still had people like Fabian, Which Ricky Palmer, Nelson. Teen Idols. Teen Idols, yeah. And that's so, what you were going for, which is, for solo. You were doing solo, not playing the guitar. Right, I would do uh, record hop, so to speak, uh, after I had a record out. And what had happened was when I met Dick, he introduced me to people like a guy, Gene Taylor, who was a program director at WLS. Who all then they introduced me to a couple of guys that are the biggest record promoters in the city of Chicago, a guy named Pete Wright, Howard Bedno. They took me in the studio. I auditioned. Actually, I went in there with a band that I knew, and we did Runaway, the song Runaway. This is how I got my first recording that way. And the first take, I've never heard myself before out of a studio. So here I am at 16, third year of high school. I'm testing in this place. It was called International Recording Company, IRC, and I started singing Runaway, and when I, they played it back, I went, oh, that's terrible. And they hit you with one of these. Don't worry about it, we'll call you. <laughs> and I go, us, we'll call you. I'm not leaving. And I was dead serious, I didn't want, no, let me do it again. And then they signed me after that, they signed me to a recording contract, and I had my first record out called Over the Mountain, and that was when I was 16. You know, just uh, trivial, trivial, where was uh, WLS Studio? I remember where... Stone Container Building, down okay. on Wacker Drive, right? Yes. Right on the river there. Upstairs, okay. yeah. And WCFL used to be in the marina. I don't marina remember towers. exactly where CFL was. I do remember the co competition between the two was interesting. Yeah, it was pretty, you know, but... It was a wonderful experience yeah. once we got on. What there. was going on with the, there was charts. I mean, there was, um, Billboard was national and the hottest hits. And then there was WLS. Correct. And Silver yeah. Dollar Survey. Silver Dollar Survey, yeah. So you were getting songs locally you were doing yes. quite well. Well, when you're referring prior to the New Colony Well, Six, yeah, you had some on there I had well. record, yeah, because, what, because of Pete and Howard uh, and the local thing, when I was 16, like I say, here I am, a kid in high school, and they're playing it on WLS, which was smoking at the time. And that was, I think, even before CFL was around. So WLS was playing me. W, we were talking about, a little earlier, we were talking about Howard. Howard Miller, yeah. Yes. WIND, WJJD. Right, they were playing it. So they, I got to meet all these people, know them, but I never really had a hit record with it. But yet again, because back in those days, there enough connections, mm -hmm. and it would be like, all of a sudden your record's going, where? You're not really selling much. And I don't know if the word payola really applies when you think of cash, but yeah. a lot of gifts were given out back in those days. We would get somebody a radio, you know. And so as yeah. it turns out, I had records out, and I, and I had about three or four that were out. And um, anyway, yeah, so that was it for me, WLS, and uh, it was pretty exciting for a kid my age, you know, to be able to do that. Nice, 16 I, years I, I And still in high school. Still in high school, third year, yeah. So how is it you came about that you joined the New Colony Six? I met them at Columbia College. I went to Columbia College years later. 
well, high school, what, you know, what was I, 18, 9, 20? <coughs> Excuse me. I did not want to work for a living. I don't believe in uh, yeah, I've right. said that my whole life. You it ain't working out, though. It's not, <laughs> is it? You know, it's amazing. Well, in reality, I wanted a hit record. All I cared about, I didn't care about anything but getting a hit record. I wanted, I was praying, you know, please, God, can I have a hit record? Can I have a hit record? And I, it's really true. And, and when I met the New Colony Six at Columbia College, they had been familiar with my background because they heard of me because of WLS. Mm -hmm. And they asked me to audition. They wanted to, one of the keyboard player wasn't going to be with them anymore, a guy named Craig Kemp. And I was supposed to take his place. And I don't play piano. I just go like this. I confess to you. You know, that kind of thing. I just changed the melody. I confess to you have a word. That's not how it goes. Anyway, so I'm doing that, <laughs> but I got by. And as it turns out, I, you know, more of the guitar thing. And uh, they, they passed me, man. I passed the audition. And uh, ever since then, I was with the band. So that's what happened. And they, 1967. After my reading, they had already uh, had a, they had, a right, hit. Right, exactly. I Confess, it was called. Well, was no. Called. What happened was, when I met them at Columbia College, nobody knew who they were. I didn't know who they were. They didn't ask me to come in until after they did have their I Confess came out. When I met them... I'm, that's how I got with the colony. But if you want to back up a little bit, then when I met them at that, they said, we're with a band, and we, I can, uh, we have a record we're doing, we're going to be recording. Where's that? IRC, International Recording Company. That was when I was 16. I said, oh, Stu Black, the engineer. We were at the studio. I said, you mind if I come? No, nah, come on down. They're recording. I confess they have a willingness and want, right? So now they're doing it. And the, the guy, and they were, dang, 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 that's a fill. And the guy that was, Stu Black, was the engineer, said, why don't we put that guitar sound out of the Leslie speaker of the Hammond B3 organ? Yeah, it does have that cool that, sound. Wah, 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 right? Wah, 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 wah. So that's where that idea came from. And by the way, I talked to Tommy James. This was honest, this was amazing. Of the Shondells. Tommy, yes. And Tommy James said, New Colony 6, Stu Black. And I go, oh, are you kidding me? How did he, because he used to live in Michigan, and he heard WLS all the time, and New Colony was the first band in 65 to come out of Chicago. And that's really that right? how this all came, you know. So whatever question you asked me, I have no idea. What is Capital of Wyoming? <laughs> Capital um, Wyoming. No, how Elmhurst. it is you came about to join the, the New Colony Six? Well, and that's when that, the audition, that the that's when the, after I Confess came out, it became number two record here. I was still not with them. And they, they what, they, they got together and created their own label? Yeah, their father, the father of Ray Graffia, who was a founding member, and Pat McBride, a founding member. Ray Graffia's father was the one who got together with some of the other fathers, I think, of, the, of that uh, group. And they organized a uh, record label called Centaur. And when, um, that's how I Confess came out on that label. So I'm the one that introduced them because since I had the experience with Pete Wright and Howard Ben, who had me when, when I was 16 doing my own record, mm -hmm. they didn't have any management. They had, there was nobody. I said, and they're the ones, by the way, again, Pete and Howard were the ones that introduced, that took I Confess. I made, I introduced them to New Colony. He became their manager. Uh, Pete and Howard became their manager. Since they're the biggest record promoters, they're the ones that got mm -hmm. I Confess out on the air with Don Centaur, the local label, and it became whoosh, number two. Nice. And then again, the yes, go ahead. That's what it was all about, <clears throat> was getting a record, right? I mean, because there was a million garage bands. Cor correct. Right? So the way, the key to getting ahead like that was you'd have, you'd have to, A, write songs. Right, they wrote all their own stuff. B, the and then meet people did. like yeah. that. Yeah, in a lot of cases back then, yeah. And you were even, you guys were wearing the, uh, the costumes, the revolutionary costumes. Oh, the, well, like what happened... Like Paul Revere and the Raiders, as, just as an example. This is a thing that has been posted that when New Colony, and I did this before I knew them, but they were out in California trying to make it, never made it there. When they came back to Chicago, the fathers, again, put together a label. They put out, I confess, you know, with Pete and Howard, all that thing. And, and uh, they were wearing the... It was just a coincidence. They wore the same outfit as Paul Revere and the Raiders, what they met out in California. But again... Uh, 
they were kind of surprised to see that. It was a coincidence, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they wore those. They, and again, their name came about because back then, all these groups started to come out of England. Manfred Mann, Beatles, of course, starting it. Well, the whole invasion. The invasion, thank you. Yeah, the British invasion. And so they decided, we're from America. <whistles> Colonies, there you go. Nice. That's it. And Mike Douglas even had the question, was, <laughs> Tell the new Colony 6, he said, why is there seven guys? <laughs> you were the seven. What happened was, we were on the Mike Douglas show in 69, with things I like to say. And... He noticed the backdrop, says New Colony 6, the backdrop for us that are posting up there. Well, I had the seventh guy, of course, in the group with us, you know, Chuck Jobes. He goes, wait a minute. And he counts out seven guys. <laughs> he goes, there's 70. It says six. And then Pat explained it to one of the guys in the foreground, you know, who was being interviewed by uh, Mike Douglas. And I don't even know what kind of explanation he gave, but... Turned out to be I think seven. he said it was like some mystic secret or something. What did he say? Some mystic secret of why he couldn't oh, explain it. Yeah, I have no and idea. And the co-host was Jimmy Dean. Yeah. And you know that Jimmy show? Jimmy Dean. I used to watch a Mike Douglas show religiously. He's from he, Chicago. He is from Chicago. Yeah. What a nice guy. Yeah. You know, we got there at the studio. Where was that tape? Was Philadelphia. that Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, okay. And we were there. It's not a big audience. It's maybe 150 people. And the guy goes, where's the equipment? Our stuff wasn't there yet. Our no. guitars. And so the director wasn't very happy. You know, our roadies, uh, if you want to use that term, weren't there yet. So that wasn't too cool. I remember that very well. But it came off well. They, we used a track. We had done a TV show prior, a national show. And, then, and the show was with uh, Lloyd Thaxton. I remember him. And it was an ABC. It was a summer replacement show for the Jerry Lewis show. And we were on there. It was all these new people coming out of the city of Chicago. Or not Chicago, I'm sorry, all over the country. We happen to have I Will Always Think About You. And all of a sudden, we're on this thing in 1968. And Lloyd Taxon goes, you know, there's only going to be 30 million people watching, so don't worry. <laughs> well, hello. So now I'm downstairs. Now, Les Cummel, the guy who wrote I Will Always Think About You with me, I watched the tape when we were done. There's a live audience, by the way. It was so, I would go, I will always think about you, right? And all of a sudden, you sound just like the record. Imagine that. I don't know why that is. I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, so as it turns out, Les Cummel is singing background. And I hear, oh, are you? I go, what the hell? Is this? I'm, I'm listening to this sound out of, where's the blend? What's he doing? And I go, I can't go back to Chicago because we knew the bucket. We knew all these other guys that were having, that we knew. I was embarrassed. Yeah. And that tape I haven't seen, or that show. But I remember seeing that in the truck when they showed it, uh, what we had just done. And I went, oh, my God. So from that experience, I decided when we do the Mike Douglas show, which, by the way, we were supposed to do the, we thought we were doing the Ed Sullivan show. And we never got the Ed Sullivan show. It said we got the Mike Douglas show, and that was it. Uh, so when we did the Mike Douglas show, I said, I think we used some band tracks on <laughs> that. <laughs> Where you where, ain't gonna be no more live background, but I was singing live. Now, now back to that. How I'll was see it? it. Who, no, no. Was good. No, I'm sorry. Now back to the music. Yeah, please. Who was responsible to get you on shows? Your a agents? Yes, I would assume booking agents, or it must have been booking agents. Uh, I don't know exactly. We weren't with William Morris. That was the Buckingham tour with them, the biggest booking. I don't. Uh, could have been guys out of Chicago yeah. at the time. Uh, I don't remember exactly the name. Willard Alexander was the name of one of the companies. They're a big agency. Um, but it was exciting. It was well, exciting. There was so much going on. I mean, with uh, well, the British invasion and the American comeback yeah, or the, yeah. against it all. All the American people picked up on it. But we talked about it earlier how um, a lot of bands were doing uh, promotional. I guess now they're called uh, music videos. Right. But a lot of bands back then were doing, you know, a, a video of their song in the studio correct. and all that. Correct, correct. Did that come about for you guys, or are there any of those we, out there? We did one in Arkansas, Hot Spring. I don't know why. We were down there for a reason. But I think we might have even been there just to do this video. I have no idea. All I do know is that it never came out. We never, I've never seen it. Ray mm. might, Ray Graffy, who's the founder again, Ray might have a copy of it. Yeah. I never even asked Ray, if you're watching, yeah. send us a video. yeah. Um, like well, you mentioned it already, too, but it seemed like there was a great bond between the 
bands coming Correct. out of Chicago, like yeah. yourselves, the Crying Shames, the Buckinghams. Yeah. You want to talk a little bit about that? Everybody knew everybody, but everybody at that time wanted a hit record and wanted a national hit. The Buckinghams were the A, number one, top 10, top five, number one. You know, I'm at home one day and I, I hear kind of a drag. And I'm going, eh, it's okay. Eh, I don't think it'll do much. Whew, number one yeah. in the United States. That's it. After that, they had they were the ones that really did well out of Chicago. They were the biggest group out of Chicago at the time in the United States. And after that, you know, now that they came out of Chicago, people around the country, the radio stations stuff are listening to what's coming out. But after a period of time, the crying shames really didn't get that opportunity. They were on Columbia Records, but by the time they had like uh, you know, Sugar and Spice and Could Be We're in Love, which was number one here for a number of weeks, the promotion department for Columbia didn't do that well. So they really didn't get the right, Tiny. they didn't have the right, uh, you know, to get that high. But we knew each other, getting back to the feeling, we all liked each other. We worked with each other, because you would do jobs and you find out, oh, they're gonna be with us, you know, American yeah. Breed's gonna do a job with us, and we're all friends. Chicago guy, all the guys out of Chicago are really down to earth, nice people. You know, next door guys. The shadows They're, of night. Yeah. But Jimmy Sands, he's crazy. He's a crazy. He's, crazy. he's a good guy. A good crazy. Eyes of March. I love him. <clears throat> Jim Pederick, let me <coughs> tell you, you know, they're wonderful people. These guys are, it's like I say, I'm not making that up. Now, as you become popular, so to speak, or your records are out, you're hearing tunes, you're hearing on the radio, it could change some people, yeah. I would assume, but I think I, the guys that I know, it didn't, it didn't, the Chicago guys are cool guys. Yeah. Yeah, they're all like that. Chicago people are good people. I mean, I hope we didn't leave anybody out, but I know that, you know, the bigger the bands are, the sticks. Oh, he's a, Dennis DeYoung is a good dude, man. You know, I met him years ago, and, uh, you know, this ties in again with the American breed. Um, with Gary Loizel, because this was, they recorded, Sticks recorded all their stuff in the beginning here in Chicago at Oak Lawn, in Oak Lawn, at Pumpkin Studios, which was Gary Loizel, who was the engineer, who was the lead singer, Gary Loizel, of American Breed, who sang Bend Me, Shape Me. And yeah, they're, Dennis is a good guy. He, you know, again, I didn't know the other guys. I knew Dennis. And uh, I think he's a nice, he's a nice guy. Um, but again, now you're talking going from the Buckingham, now we're down another number of years, and here comes Sticks. Bam again. Yeah. Big time. And, you know, Ides of March, who back when they had a vehicle, it became a number three record in the United States, and at least top five, and it could have been number one in one of the magazines. But the reality is, some groups are fortunate enough to continue. Writing is not easy. You know, people, they want to do, there's no guarantee. It's like going to a horse race. You don't know what's going to happen, what's not going to happen. You don't know. Uh, but Sticks, obviously, being with the label they were with, the record label, extremely well. Yeah. One after another, and I'm going, wow, that's that's pretty smoking. You know, Cheap Trick's not from far away either. Rockford. Right, you know, there's another group that hit. But Sticks, and and then again, Survivor. So we got a lot of Chicago, of course, being the Beatles of the nice city. Title. They're the, the Beatles. Beatles of Chicago. Huh? The Beatles of Chicago. That's yeah, a good title. I'd say. And Beatles, they yeah. will be uh, inducted into the uh, Rock and Roll Hall. That's of what I. That's what I'd like to see. That long overdue. You know, Biondi, I think Biondi again, my guy. He uh, he. If it weren't, you know, he's always been. Excuse me. He was always big on having them be in there, in the Hall of Fame, uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and, mm -hmm. and I agree. These guys, you know, you, what yeah. do you put in, Ramones in there? You put the, what are you judging by? Yeah. See, I'm not a big fan of Hall of Fame things. Sports, yeah, because you're doing physical stuff, and you're really showing physical ability. Well, it's but about records, doing the come voting, on, man, right? You know, it's unless you got a zillion records sale. Hey, when we had things I like to say, and I would always think about, I'm turning Italian. That's I okay. love it. I'm an Italian wannabe guy. And what happened was, when I, uh, this Hall of Fame stuff, when I was, when we was uh, New Colony, 68, 69, 
we were the group of the year at WLS on the wall in the black. Yeah. You know, seriously. So you got groups like that. They're bringing in the Hall of, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. You know, the Hoochie Schmookies. And I'm going, one uh, record. I mean, who, what, where is it coming from? Who's, who's deciding this stuff? Yeah. And what's the point of that? You know, I, I, is that on record sales? Who, what are you judging it by? I understand Paul McCartney. You know, the same thing when they use the term superstar. Yeah. Now superstars for everything. He was a superstar. He was a superstar. To me, a superstar is Elvis Presley, Paul McCartney. You know, I am talking superstars. And then they start using it, you know, for every day. Anyway, that's me. No, you are a very credited person, I think, to give that opinion. Just, I mean, everybody that listens to music can voice their opinion, but it comes from you, from your heart, that, yeah. uh, you know, and you're in the business. I just don't believe much in that. I don't think the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or, or you know, we're, <laughs> supposedly, I wasn't there. I didn't go. I think we're in the Hall of Fame somewhere. You know where we yeah. are? In the bin outside the <laughs> Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. In one of the bins, you can buy a new colony thing. <laughs> Or you go to Iowa. We're actually in Iowa record record hall of fame in Iowa. So what? Are, you know, seriously, what? Are, you know, where's it in the kitchen somewhere? I don't know. Where, but I'm not moaning about that. I'm just saying that I don't know where to get their decision making of what. Yeah. You know, who's voting? And, yeah, exactly. Um, That's it. I'm angry. No, go ahead. get pissed. It's good. Let yeah. it go. Okay. What was that movie, uh, Broadcast News, where the guy's yelling out the window? I'm okay now. <laughs> That's right. Are we at the first level? <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> after all that conversation, we're saying about how everybody in Chicago had somewhat of a brotherhood. Yeah. There's uh, what's called the Cornerstone of Rock. Oh, is what, a you documentary. brought that up. Oh, yeah. And I'm glad you did, because we're doing it in theaters. For people that are not familiar with it, Cornerstones of Rock was an idea that came about from Jim Piedrick, the Ides of March guy and Survivor guy, along with a guy named Joe Thomas. They got together, they presented it to another, can I say the station? Yeah, it's a, well, it's WTW. Yeah. All right, WTTW um, did a thing in October. We recorded a thing, and it was all the groups that we were just mentioning came out of Chicago. The New Colony, American Bree, Crying Chain, Buckingham, Shadows of Night, uh, as I say, Crying Chain, Eliota, and also uh, they... Um, Haynes and Jeremiah. Yeah, one of them unfortunately has passed. Oh, I'm and, sorry. And you know what's really give bad? credit for the. I, I the forgot. News. I don't know whether it was Jeremiah or the other cat. They had uh, Lakeshore Drive. Right. right. Big record locally. And and uh, did I leave anyone out in this one? Should be about whatever. Oh, you mean for the show? For the 60s. Well, on this Cornerstones of Rock. So that was aired in December. And they, um, they might re air it. Uh, somebody told me they might rerun it on the 16th of whatever, March. But anyway, um, in, a, in a, any case, we did this thing, it came out great. It was our idea, it came out very well. And uh, now we're bringing it to a couple of theaters. And so that's it, you know, basically. The Cornerstones of Rock. Cornerstones of Rock. Um, for those who might remember, we were talking <laughs> earlier right, about the wild, go <laughs> the yeah. wild goose. Yeah, the Wild Goose Dex Card. One of the, I love Dex Card. But Dex Card was a great, you know, Wild Goose, they would take a place, uh, a building. It was wild a traveling Goose. dance show, but it was also a showcase for Chicago bands, right? Correct. They would, you know, it's like doing a circuit. So you got guys doing this one here in Joliet, or you have it doing it here, or Joliet, man. And uh, here and there and everywhere. And uh, we did it. And they had a lot of groups that went to those Wild Gooses. Um, they were very, uh, I'll tell you, you get name acts in there, you do well. It was a big thing uh, back then, the uh, Battle of the Bands. You'd be yeah. able to see a lot of places. But I mean, you guys were a step above that, obviously. Well, I've never been part of something like that. They might have done it prior. I don't know if the New Colony ever did a Battle of the Bands. That's what I'm saying. They were yeah. already <clears throat> to the commercial point. But, but I meant before that. Thing. Yeah. Uh, and then just to go through a few names, if you want to share anything about uh, some famous Chicago DJs, Larry Lujak. Larry Lujak was Larry probably Lujak. one of the nicest guys I've ever met. You know, a lot of people thought it's kind of hard, you know, tough Super guy. Jack. Super Jack, that's right, I forgot. Forgot. <laughs> You're good, you. And, me? Uh, okay, well, oh, no, you. Oh. And uh, you are good. <laughs> you also. Uh, anyway, so. Um, Larry Lujak. He was so. 
He's just a good guy. You know, anybody that's nice to me, I'm happy with. You know, I call him a nice guy because they were nice to me. Yeah. And Lou Jack was one of those guys. He would always say nice things. And wow. Fred so Winston. Sad. Huh? Fred Winston. Nice guy again. Good guy. And I would think, you know, he tried to, I think it was on something not too long ago around here. So I don't know where he is, what he's doing now, mm -hmm. actually. But I knew all of them. Yeah. Well, everybody. I'm Bob just Collins. Some names out there. Yeah, you Yeah, Bob Collins, time. great guy. He was very supportive. Um, Beyondy, that's like home. That's like family. Because, again, I told he's you, I knocked on his strong. door so when he's, I was what, 84? He's, yeah, he's 84. 84. Can I say that? Yeah. Sure I can. That he's 84? What you going to do, beat me up? Anyway, so is it. Yeah, don't tell him. 84, I think, yeah. So as it turns out, he uh, he's doing it a couple of days a week now on WLS. And during the day, which I think is even better, early in the morning, than the time slot he had recently. He's a Chicago, as yourself a Chicago legend. Um, Wait a minute, i got to tell you one. Can you get a second? I ain't going nowhere. Okay. I, do, I might have a meeting later. <laughs> I don't know. We were, we were at a restaurant a while back. This guy walks into a restaurant. All right, go ahead. Yeah, there was, a horse came in. No, and there was a waitress, and she recognizes his voice. She goes, he sounds familiar. And I said, you know, he sounds, he sounds like Dick Biandi. It could be Dick Biandi's brother. She goes, really? I said, no, that's him. She went nuts, man. Yeah. And you know why? She hears him in the daytime now. She never heard him at night, you know, when he had the later thing. Okay, go ahead. I see you want to Well, he is, I mean, I don't know what the, how many decades it is, but it's got to be like five he's a, decades. That yeah, he's, he's been a legend. Yeah, he's been at for a long time. Um, he's good friends with Abraham Lincoln. I don't is know he? The, oh, very much. They went so. to school together. Yeah, they used to build cabins together. Yeah, go ahead. Um, what did, what's your thoughts on present day music? I think some of it's getting better. I mean, when you say better, look at it. Music and food are things that are individual things. You can't tell somebody. Very this nicely is. put. You like that? Yeah, I do. Thank you. What's your, no, anyway, so uh, today's music, some of which, I mean, good examples are like Adele or whatever. They, you know, I don't, I'm really not up with it. I don't I keep in touch with it, you know, because I'm an old person. <laughs> and my background is all the guys I grew up with. And I'm not really that interested in the new stuff. Never mm -hmm. have been. So, you know, I like some. Nah, I don't like any of it. I don't listen to any of it. I shouldn't say I don't like well, it. We're gonna I, move I don't listen to it. When we're on the next show, we're going to talk about, uh, you and I are going to talk about technology. Hold on. Hello. Yeah. Whoa. Hold on. It's Dick Biondi for you. Oh, thank you. you got to talk a second. Talk. Hello? How are you? What? I right, tell him we're busy. Is this Dick? We're busy. Tell Dick Biondi we're busy. We got. Hey, go. Dick. Yeah. Listen, we're on the air right now. We just said nice things about you. Okay, I'll talk to you later. It's been a pleasure. Ronnie. Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you. Bye. Uh, here's some good. cannolis for you. Oh, man. Leave the gun, take the cannolis. A you're true so honor sweet. to have a Chicago legend on the you're show. You're so here. nice. Thanks, you're, Vince. Thank you so much. Guy. Will you Seriously. come back? I'd love to. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry I got to go. Where are you going? I just, I can't, I can't the party's just starting. I can't sit here all day. Why not? I'm busy. What do you mean you're busy? I got to go. Thanks for being on. Ronnie Rice, I will always think about you. Oh, thank you. No, I always think about you, too. Wait a minute.